Good morning. Welcome to the penultimate session of your advanced course. We're going to, this morning, fix this ugly looking proximal femur. And we'll just briefly run through what's wrong with it. It is a, uh, a proximal femur rather than a femoral neck malunion in which we have a varus component, a apex anterior or extension component. And if we look at it in this plane, there is a retroversion component. So I'll just remind you what the normal version of the total torsional alignment of the femur should be in males around 10 degrees and aversion and about 15 in women. So we have a triplanar deformity. And in order to simplify things, we're going to take our radiographs, which you have at your table. There is an, a, a full length AP of the deformed side. There is a full length AP of your normal side. And then you have the two corresponding laterals. Now, you would typically not use a full length film to plan from. You'd normally use a spot film after you've decided what your leg length discrepancies and the remainder of your components' uh, deformities are. Uh, and to make things further simplified today, we're going to plan only from the AP. And I'll show you uh, the sagittal and horizontal plane corrections in the second stage. So we're going to have a right deformed femur. Here's our contralateral, quote, normal, although it has a CCD or neck shaft angle of 120. And you could certainly correct this back to a normal CCD angle of 127 or 130 even if you wanted, as long as you compensated for length in the process. So what we're going to do at, as we start today is we're going to try to replicate a workflow which you can take to a digital platform uh, in a generic way, planning to a normal side. So we will have a left normal, which we will trace like that. We'll have an abnormal. And so if we go through this exercise, we have our abnormal here. We have our normal here. And without even measuring our neck shaft angles, we should be able to calculate the abnormality as far as the correction is concerned just by superimposing, for instance, corresponding neck angles and measuring this at, we would have this angle, or if we didn't want to do that, we just want to measure our shaft axis, we should get the same correction here regardless of which of our anatomic axis we use as a reference. So as a check, we've measured 125, and we've also measured here 95. So, or 120 minus um, <clears throat> 95. So if we then subtract that, we should be able to get a, come up with our correction of 100 or 25 degrees in the frontal plane. And that's going to drive our, our primary planning in this uh, single projection planning exercise. So we have a normal, an abnormal with a corresponding anatomic axis drawn in. The next thing we're going to do is take our deformity again, and we're going to say, here's our axes reproduced. And then we're going to make some suppositions about what we want this to look like. Now, with a 25 degree frontal plane correction, you could make that correction anywhere between here and normal diaphysis. 
And how you make that decision is based on, as, as we uh, talked about yesterday with Hobie's proximal femur case, healing time, which is much better in the intertrochanteric area, um, as well as the actual shape of the femur. We want it to look like a femur when we're done. And so I will arbitrarily state that I'd like to have a neck back. So I want the exit point of the osteotomy to be very close to anatomic neck. So that's here. The next simplification, which I'd like to uh, sort of put forward, was rather than having a correction which has two oblique components, I'd rather have one transverse osteotomy just because it's easier to plan from. So if we have our a reference Kirshner wire here perpendicular to the long axis, and I put it in here, then this is gonna be a much easier starting point. The other reason why a transverse osteotomy in this setting is gonna be useful is because we're going to make a transverse osteotomy and then medially rotate this distal segment approximately 25 degrees or 20 degrees to compensate for the retrotorsion and then cut this closing wedge. If you make two obliquities with a closing 25 degree wedge, then you're really gonna have a uh, confounding problem as you try to compensate for the torsional component. So I've just arbitrarily said, I want a transverse osteotomy to make a neck and here is the uh, variety of different 25 degree corrections. And we can look at this with a second component, which is the proximal fragment. So this part is gonna be, no matter how I do this, I'm gonna have this proximal segment. So I'm gonna draw that separately and then I can bring this back parallel to this 25 degree corrections, and we can look at the extremes of correction. So I can have a pure opening 25 degree wedge, which is inherently unstable and will have a very slow healing time, but will give us the biggest uh, correction in leg length. Or I can do a pure closing wedge, which will give us the most stability the fastest healing times, but the least correction in uh, leg length discrepancy. With the exception that with each of these variations, we can then carry out varying degrees of shaft translation along an obliquity, which will gain some length. Now we have to make a, decide, a decision about how much shaft translation we can tolerate on the basis of what the anatomic and mechanical axis of the, of the knees would be. So if you go into valgus, you theoretically would like to have lateral shaft translation so that you don't displace the uh, weight-bearing axis at the knee, which is a long-term consideration in young patients. Yeah, so we're gonna, we have a variety of different uh, components to think about in this plan. So we can make a variety of different plans here, the nice thing about leaving this entire malformed femur here is that we can readily check how much leg length we're gonna pick up. And then, so I'm gonna arbitrarily at some point say, I like that appearance because I've gotten back my designated two centimeters of leg length. We've, we will give you that you're two centimeters short and that's what you'd like to get back. And then my translation here is based on where the trochanter is relative to the canal. And what I think I could live with as far as a late reconstruction if this fails and how can I get a femoral component in if this turns into an arthroplasty. So obviously this would be the best position, but we've essentially re get, regained none of the offset we've lost with our um, original deformity. So we'll come to this and then arbitrarily accept that. And then we're just going to hold this, all right? 
So this is our final construct. This is what we're going to look like. I might change this. I might draw two or three of these until I found one that I was really happy with. Now at this point, we've got to figure out how we're going to fix it. So we're going to overlay this on our um, We will convert this drawing to this drawing. Pretend you don't see the blade plate yet. All right, so I will I take this and I'll make another uh, image which will capture that complete deformity correction with a partial opening, partial closing wedge. And then we'll put our template beneath this. We'll overlay it and come up with where our implant's going to sit. Now, it may be at this point that I've created so much offset that my implant, irrespective of whether I use a high-angled or standard 95-degree blade, is not going to work, and then I have to go back and redo the process. So in this case, we're going to now draw in our blade plate, or, and this is a 95, but typically for these, you'd use a higher angle. And now we have an implant, you put your screws in if you want, and you're going to then take this back to our deformity. So we're going to now overlay this on our original deformity in this manner. Okay, so we superimpose the proximal components, and if we do that, then we'll be able to translate the position of the blade onto the deformity, and we'll position that blade in a place where we want to maintain a minimum of a centimeter and a half of lateral cortex, which isn't going to be a problem today, and leave room for a reference Kirshner wire here. So this path is now reproduced here as a seating chisel path. And then we have to measure that angle relative to essentially a perpendicular, which is 20 degrees off the axis. And I've measured from the tip of the trochanter, which is a relatively easy uh, reference radiographically, to the top of the blade. You can measure to the bottom if you want. And then I measure from the bottom of the blade to the level of the osteotomy. Here it's a very large distance. There'll be many osteotomies where you'll be pushing it as far as the limit. So now I have my deformity, and I have where the seating chisel is going to go in, and I have the closing wedge at the point that I uh, ultimately going to ex am going to execute it. So it's a partial closing, partial opening wedge, and then we have a, a series of reference Kirshner wires. Perpendicular, perpendicular, closing wedge, blade plate reference. And all of these are then going to, be need, are going to need to be uh, transposed to your model before you go ahead to the actual execution. So this is a reminder what we're dealing with, a frontal plane correction of 25 degrees, sagittal 15, horizontal 20, and what I did not put in here again is uh, we want to regain approximately two centimeters of leg length uh, in the process of this plan. Okay. Go ahead, come in. All right. Good morning, guys. That case pretty much does itself, so don't really need to pay attention too much to Dr. And what Dr. Mayo said. But I know a lot of you are uh, traveling today. So I um, wanted to just share some of the weather reports. Um, up here in uh, Quebec, everything looks nice and clear. East Coast looks nice and pretty clear. We've got some precipitation down here in Florida. John Scalero and company traveling to the West Coast. Things look pretty uh, clear. Milton Little traveling to 90210. Right about there. Looks pretty good. I thought I'd get some more laughs, but uh, OK, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe people are a little overwhelmed. All right, here's a summary slide. Um, again, the deformity is a seven-degree retroversion, 
and we want 15 degrees of aneuversion. So that's a clinical assessment, okay? And you saw Dr. Mayo looking down the pipe of the femur. Um, so that's usually a clinical assessment by the rotational profile, or if you need a CT scanogram, that's how you get that. The varus that we got is 25 degrees. Again, that's radiographic, with measuring the neck shaft angle, or the delta, 120 minus 95 is 25. The 20 degree apex anterior deformity, that's also radiographic, and the two centimeters of shortening. There's a lot of confusion with retroversion and what you have to do. Just keep in mind, retroversion is an external rotation deformity of the distal segment. So the math works out if the patient's in seven degrees of retroversion and we want 15 degrees of antiversion, you have to add the two, which equals 22, and we're just gonna round to a practical number of 20. So in your plan, you need to rotate internally the distal segment 20 degrees. Okay, so our summary slide is here. We're gonna concentrate in the next half hour approximately on the plan, and we have the pertinent points uh, uh, bullets here. Um, your table instructors will be there to help you. Remember there are an essentially an infinite number of different osteotomies which will provide a correction in the frontal plane, uh, and only a few of them are gonna be relatively easy to execute in the other dimensions. Okay, let's go ahead.